Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that you reveal yourself to us through it. And we ask that today as we look into this story of the flood and particularly looking to see your grace through it, Lord, I ask you to help us to understand clearly and to apply rightly in our lives today. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So this week, we've come to the sixth part of our series through the first 11 chapters of Genesis. And our focus in this series has been on finding our place in God's story. And we're calling this God's story because God is the main character of the Bible. Everything is written from, well, mostly from his perspective, but he's the one who's active in the story. So in the story so far is that God created everything for his own glory, and he made humans to rule and tame the earth according to his goodness. However, since the first humans began to define good apart from God, everything began to go downhill. Human sin filled the world with evil and with violence and, in, and all of that instead of God's goodness. So finally, God made the very difficult decision to blot out the corrupt humanity with a huge flood. Last week, when we were looking at this story, we were looking at it from the perspective of finding God's goodness in his judgment. And the big question that we asked was, did all those people really deserve to die? This week, we're looking at it from the perspective of finding God's grace in the flood. And so the big question is, did Noah and his family deserve to be saved from the flood? And I was just about to click the slide. I realized I left the clicker over on the table over here. So I'm just going to have to run back and grab it. I think it's over there. Oh, no, 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 I didn't. I put it in my pocket. <laughs> Does that, you ever do that? <laughs> okay. Ah, and it's working perfectly. Okay, excellent. I do that sometimes. You ever done that where you're looking all through the house for something and you're holding it or it's in your pocket? There we go. Okay, so back to the sermon. Did no one in his family deserve to be saved from the flood? You see, a lot of us, a lot of people go through life thinking that, uh, that when you get to the end, all of your good deeds and all of your bad deeds to be sort of weighed on scales, and if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, then you'll be okay. So is, is that what's going on here? It, it was Noah and his family righteous enough to be favored by God? Because if they were, then maybe we can earn our salvation too. But if not, then we're, the, we're only saved because of the grace of God. So that's what I'm going to be looking at today in the story of Noah. We considered how, last week we considered how God's goodness is revealed in his judgment. And this week we're looking at the same story to see how his goodness is revealed by his grace despite sin. So the great human problem that we just can't escape from on our own is sin and the death that comes as a result of sin. Every single human being dies, and that's the evidence that sin is active in us. So being helpless to save ourselves, we have to rely on God to save us. In the account of the flood, God revealed his goodness by saving Noah and his family. And what I hope to show today is that when God saved Noah and his family, he saved them by his grace, received through faith, and based on an atoning sacrifice. So we're going to be looking at the text now. First of all, Noah received God's grace by faith. Um, when we follow the theme of God's judgment in the flood, the major focus was on God's assessment of humanity. Remember back in chapter 6, verses 5 through 7, God's conclusion was that every intention of the heart of every human being was only evil all the time. And then in contrast, verse 8 begins to characterize Noah in a seemingly different way. Verse 8 says, but... Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And incidentally, the word favor um, in the original language is the word that we get the word where we get grace from, right? It's the idea of something that you, uh, 
receive from someone else without doing something to get it. And so this first statement about Noah is that he found favor in God's sight. When you look through the Old Testament, the most common use of this phrase it was to request something of another person based on that person's feelings for the requester. So the phrase was, if I have found favor in your sight, and then the request would come after that. So basically, if you like me, please do this thing for me. In nearly all the places where this phrase is found, the favor that the person is hoping to um, have in the eyes of the other person was based on a long relationship. I think that kind of implies that God and Noah had a long relationship up to this point. Um, I think we see that elsewhere in the text. For example, God spoke to Noah, so uh, Noah didn't seem very surprised by that. At least it's not recorded in the text. Um, and then God, uh, Noah obeyed and did everything that God said. So it seems like there was some kind of relationship in place there already. But importantly, most importantly, I think, favor has to originate with the person in whose eyes it's found. That is, even though Noah found favor in the sentence, like it looks like he's active in doing something here, um, it's narrated from God's perspective. And so that means that God was looking at Noah and had favor for Noah. So God's approval of Noah must have come from God himself. So the implications of this, I think, first of all, God and Noah had a long relationship prior to the events of Genesis 6 through 9, but also I think that Noah did not earn or gain God's favor. Instead, God looked on Noah with favor. Now, uh, with this understanding of favor in God's eyes, I think we can make a little bit better sense of the descriptions of Noah in the following verses. In verses 6 through 9 over here, um, we have this Toledoth, this, this uh, generations of Noah. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. Noah is described with these three descriptions here, righteous, blameless, and walked with God. I think it would be important for us to take a moment and meditate on what a high description Noah is given here. He, he, you know, I can't attain to a description like this. But if we work backwards in this, let's, let's think a little bit more deeply about this description. There's only one other person in the whole Bible who is described as walking with God. And uh, for, for any of our Bible trivia nerds, um, who was it that walked with God apart from Noah? Enoch. Enoch. There we go. Enoch. <laughs> Noah's great-great-great-grandfather was Enoch, and he's an interesting character because his place in Scripture is so short and yet so extraordinary. In Genesis 5.24, Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. That's it. That's his whole description. But, I mean, can you imagine if that was on your tombstone? <laughs> he walked with God, and he was not for God took him. And then you've only got a tombstone there because, you know, people wanted to remember you somehow. <laughs> but you're not there. So it's this really, really interesting phrase. Um, and it's really quite extraordinary because somehow Enoch didn't die. He was taken away. It's like, you ever seen somebody who you thought was just so holy that they might be sucked into heaven at any moment? Um, apparently that was Enoch. <laughs> and Noah is described the same way. He walked with God. Secondly, Noah is described as being blameless in his generation. The word literally means whole or complete in his generation. So um, apart from Noah, this description is only given to two other characters in the Bible, Job and Daniel. In Job's case, it was God speaking about Job to Satan when he said, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth? a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Um, just on a tangent, that's another thing worth meditating upon. If you read the book of Job, it was God who 
uh, mention Job first in the conversation with Satan. So I'd encourage you to go back and read that and think, about, think that through. In Daniel, um, at the end of his time in the den of lions, King Darius came out because he was really worried about him. He really liked Daniel. He came out and he called into the lion's den and he says, Daniel, are you there? And Daniel replies, my God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him. Now, I think we've got to be a little bit careful here because uh, blameless, while it is a very, very high uh, description, a very high distinction, it does not mean sinless, but it means at least that someone is outwardly above reproach. And in Noah's case, blamelessness is qualified by in his generation. Now, um, we already know from last week that his generation was characterized by being only evil all the time. I think the point here is not to say that Noah had no sin, but to make this huge contrast between Noah and the generation in which he lived. Despite all the evil and the violence around him, he remained blameless. He did not participate in the violence that people were doing to each other that was so prevalent in the world at that time. Finally, the third part of this description was that Noah was a righteous man. This description is a bit more common in the Bible with uh, one other person in the Old Testament and about five people in the New Testament receiving this description. Um, the five in the New Testament uh, are almost all in the Gospel of Luke. But um, the other person in the Old Testament was actually Abram. And Abram's righteousness is very significant, I think, to our understanding of God's favor towards Noah because in Genesis 15, 6, what it says is that Abram believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. So this is, this is righteousness that's counted to him because of his faith in the promise of God. He was justified by that faith. So Abram, whose life we know a little bit more about than Noah's, was certainly not a perfect or sinless man. You read about Abram and he did some really silly things sometimes. Um, well, for example, giving his wife away to another king. It's kind of frustrating. <laughs> okay, so we know that he wasn't sinful or perfect, and yet his faith in God was counted to him as righteousness. He believed that God will fulfill his promises despite the seemingly impo seeming impossibility of it, and God accepted that. So the question then for us, I think, as we're looking back at Noah, is does the same righteousness by faith apply to him as well? And uh, I think that it does. And I'm basing that not just on my own conjecture, but because the author of Hebrews thought so. So if we jump over to Hebrews chapter 11, it says, by faith, I'm going to start back in verse 5. Um, it's not up on the board, but I'll start back in verse 5 because we just mentioned Enoch. Um, and, and I just make a note here. The author of Hebrews thought not only that Noah was in this category, but also Enoch, Job, um, Abraham, um, all the people that we've just mentioned, he also puts in that same category of people who have received righteousness by faith. So by faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was, comm he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Now we get Noah, verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. The argument here is that the only way to draw near to God is to have faith in God. And Noah displayed faith in God through his obedience. If you read through the narrative of the flood, you find several times in the text, and Noah did everything that God commanded him. And so his obedience is displaying his faith. 
And then Hebrews says here, the author of Hebrews says that he believed God and he built the ark even though there was as of yet no evidence of a coming flood. And so he inherited the righteousness that comes by faith. That's he received it. It came to him. And I think it boils down to this. Noah found favor in God's eyes by faith. God's favor upon Noah was therefore not earned by the character of Noah's life, but proven by the character of Noah's life. So, okay, that's what we know about Noah in the flood. What about all the people who were outside the ark? As difficult as it is, I think that we have to conclude that Noah was the only person on the earth at that time who had that kind of faith in God. Because his family was the only one that God saved from the flood. So we see, actually, that God's goodness is revealed in saving Noah and his family because God gave them grace because of faith. And in that act also, God saved humanity from complete destruction because of his grace towards his human creatures. See, humanity was able to restart again through Noah and his family. And so God's goodness is revealed by his grace to sinners, which is received by faith. God's goodness was also revealed by his grace despite sin when he accepted Noah's sacrifice, his sacrifices. Now, we're gonna, at this point, we're going to jump to the end of the story. Um, I would just love to preach line by line through the whole uh, text of the flood narrative, but that's three chapters long, and, well, I think you guys want to get to lunch someday. <laughs> Anyway, after Noah finished building the ark and it was filled with animals, God closed it up and he kept them all safe while the rain and the groundwater swelled up for 40 days. And after it swelled up for 40 days, there was another 150 days of water completely covering the surface of the earth. And when the waters finally receded and the inhabitants of the ark finally exited at the command of God, 12 and a half months had passed. Every living creature had died except those whom God saved in the ark. And then we pick it back up in Genesis chapter 8, verses 20 to 22. We're told that the first thing that Noah did after he left the ark was he offered sacrifices to God. It says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. This is a very interesting part of the story. Um, Noah sacrificed clean animals as burnt offerings to God. Keep in mind, this is before the law came. And these burnt offerings were not eaten, so that's not what you did with a burnt offering. Um, some kinds of offerings that you made, you could, you could eat the meat from them, but the burnt offerings were, as the Bible says, turned into smoke upon the altar. They're completely consumed by the fire and burned up. And the aroma goes up into the sky. And, and it says that the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma. This is a, a little bit of a difficult thing for me to conceive of, but, you know, that's what's there in Scripture. Um, God enjoys His creation, is all I can say about that. Um, so there's a play on, on words here, though, in the original language, because Noah's name means rest, and a very similar-sounding word means to appease or to please. And that's what's, that word is used to describe the aroma of Noah's sacrifice to God. So in other words, the man of rest offered up an appeasing sacrifice and God rested from his judgment. The sacrifice that Noah offered to God, I think, was the earliest 
expression of the principle of substitutionary atonement. And I'll tell you why I think that. Because I think we have to look at this from the perspective of the original listeners of the story. The original listeners of the story were the Israelites who were camped around the base of Mount Sinai who were receiving the law from God through Moses. And so when they heard this story, they would have been reminded of the sacrificial system that God had set up for them. The system that taught them that the wage of sin is death. And it should be their deaths. But because God is gracious and merciful, he would accept the sacrifices of clean animals, the deaths of clean animals, in their place. And so this concept is so important to this part of the story because um, at least partly it resolves a major tension in our text. Because after God smelled this pleasing aroma, he decided never to strike down every living thing again. We might think, great, problem solved. But then in verse 21, we're informed that actually not much has changed since the beginning of the story. God says, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Keep in mind, at this time in the story, there are only eight people left on earth. Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. So when God makes this description, when he says the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth, he's talking about Noah and his family. Noah, who just a few, just a few chapters before, we were informed, was righteous, blameless, and walked with God, and yet still somehow sinful from his youth. This creates a huge tension in the text because the whole point of the flood was to wipe out human evil and violence, to get rid of the sin. But evil still resides in the few who were saved. And so evil is still there, sin is still there, and yet God has promised not to destroy the world again. So then this big question is brought up in this text, that is, how is God going to destroy sin, put an end to sin, without putting an end to humanity or the world. Because that's still the big problem of the text. That's still the big problem of humanity. And God still has to solve that problem as the main character of the story of the Bible. Well, I think that answer is found in Noah's sacrifice and its connection to the sacrificial system that it prefigures. God would accept a substitute sacrifice offered in faith and count that person as righteous. So from this point, we can now look forward to the New Testament. We can see this from a New Testament perspective. It's impossible for, as the author of Hebrews says, the blood of bulls and goats to take away the sins of human beings. And uh, his argument goes basically that if it was, if it was sufficient for the blood of an animal to replace the blood of a human being, then you'd only have to sacrifice an animal once and you'd be good for the rest of your life. And yet, they have to make the sacrifices year after year after year after year. And then we jump over to Romans. And there, Paul says that sinners are justified by God's grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation, that is, turn away his anger, turn away his judgment, by his blood to be received by faith. So God would accept a substitute sacrifice, and he sent his own son into the world to be that substitute sacrifice, so that whoever puts their faith in him is justified by faith. Simply put, God's goodness was revealed in his grace towards sinners in the flood and afterward because he accepted the sacrifices in anticipation of the ultimate sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, so that by faith we are counted righteous. We are counted blameless. By faith, through Christ, we also can walk with God. Let's find ourselves in this story now. 
As with many Bible stories, I think we tend to identify ourselves with the wrong characters. When we read the story of the flood, I think at least I do this, I don't know, maybe you do this too, but I tend to put myself in Noah's place and think, oh yeah, I've got to be like Noah. But the problem is, I simply can't describe myself the way that Noah was described. I can't honestly look at myself and say Micah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. That's even hard to say. <laughs> when I read that description, I, yeah, I, I feel how far I am from it. And at the same time, I feel a deep desire to be that kind of man, but I'm just not there. I think, in fact, if we're honest, we are all much more like the people who perished in the flood, who are filling the world with violence because of our sin. At best, we are like Noah's family, who were somehow saved by their association with the righteous man. But I think that therein lies the key to finding our place in the story of the flood. The Old Testament sometimes presents us with characters who, in some way, call us to look forward to Christ. In the flood narrative, I think Noah is that Christ-type character. Naturally, Noah was not perfect. We only need to read what he did after the flood to know he wasn't perfect. But he was righteous, blameless, walker with God in the beginning of the story, through whom humanity was saved. So what that's doing is it's pointing us forward. It's making us look for the Christ figure, the Christ person. And so the segment of humanity that was saved was actually Noah's own family. And what I find interesting about the family is that they are completely passive characters in the text before the flood. They don't say anything. They don't do anything. I mean, when uh, it just basically says they got into the ark with Noah, right? That's all they did. I think by some, you know, by some conjecture, we can, we can say that they must have had some kind of faith because they followed Noah into this great big box. <laughs> um, if you read the description of the ark, we have this idea of it being this beautiful um, looking boat with you know, lots of nice uh, features on the outside. And, you know, it looks beautiful in our imagination, but if you read the description of it in scripture, it's basically a big box. Um, it's, it's, it's such a box that when they get inside of it, God closes it from the side. And then it's closed, and they can't get out until God opens it back up again. So anyway, they, they saw this great big boat, this great big box, and they followed Noah into it. So, I mean, I can say perhaps they had some faith. But we don't see them doing or saying anything in the story. In fact, it, it seems that they were saved because of their relationship with Noah. But you start to see the parallels here with the New Testament. We are saved because of our association with Christ before God. Jesus is the righteous one. He's the blameless one inside and out. He's the one who walks with God because he is God. And it's through Jesus that we inherit God's grace by faith without regard to anything that we have ever said or done. So, in a sense, I think we're kind of like Noah's family. So, from this perspective now, we can actually, I think from here, now we can move forward and we can relate to Noah in some way um, in, in regard to faith and grace. See, I look at myself and I know that I am corrupt and I know I'm full of sin, and the reason I know that is because I know that God is good. And if I compare myself to God, I don't measure up. Like Noah, we all must know that we have to rely on God for salvation because we surely cannot rely on ourselves. But by faith in Jesus, whose sacrifice sets God's judgment to rest, we find favor in the eyes of the Lord. And then it becomes 
our job to be preachers of that favor to the rest of the world as well so that others might be drawn into the ark in a figurative way.